It wasn't me this morning who tried to wake you up for the first session, for those who live in the hotel. All right. Uh, with this disclaimer, uh, I will talk to, uh, uh, today about uh, some universal properties of the phase transition. This go very well beyond uh, what we study in QCD and can be applicable to any uh, phase transition in general. So most of these properties I will talk about, um, they are universal. However, I came to learn about this problem only um, uh, from the perspective of the QCD, and this is why my motivation will be from the perspective of the QCD. All right. So we know the second order phase transition, the critical exponents, and many critical amplitudes to insane degree of precision. And we know more than 19 uh, critical ampli amplitudes. So the portrait of the second order phase transition is very well established. So for example, one of these critical exponents, which I will uh, mention in my talk, the beta critical exponent, uh, thanks to conformal bootstrap, is known to the fifth digit, all right? But there is a very, uh, very uh, prominent omission uh, from this uh, studies, and this is what is called young age singularity, and specifically its universal location. And most of my talk will be about this uh, universal location. Okay? And I will tell you why uh, people before was not able to extract that, and I will tell you how we were able to do this. Okay. So this is the phase diagram of QCT, which we are trying to study. Most in this figure, uh, which I am showing you over here, is unknown. Okay? This is just... Uh, uh, this is just uh, our expectations or our, our wish list. Okay, so uh, we know that we can study uh, the uh, phase uh, diagram of QCD at zero, chemical, at zero baryon chemical potential along this line. Um, and we know uh, that there is uh, a smooth transition between hadronic degrees of freedom and quark degrees of freedom, as we colloquially refer to as crossover, and that makes condensed matter physicists very confused. All right, so now... Uh, at finite uh, baryon chemical potential, we expect to see the chiral uh, critical point, chiral phase transition critical point, uh, but uh, this is just our expectation. Uh, so why does it, it is important to study this uh, phase diagram? It's because this is the only the f uh, phase diagram of the standard model, model of particle physics that can be studied theoretically and also can be probed experimentally. Okay, if you want to study Electroweak phase transition, you will not be able to create an accelerator like that. So, although it can be probed experimentally, it's still not an easy task. So there are experimental programs which are trying to extract the position of the critical point, but in experiments with heavy ion collision. But the system is small, it lives for a very short period of time, and uh, it is not necessarily clear that you will be able to extract uh, the, uh, static, uh, the static properties of this phase transition, and specifically the location of the critical point. Okay, so the theory, well, although the underlying theory is known, the only way to simulate this is by using Monte Carlo uh, QCD cal calculations, and we know that at finite baryon chemical potential, there is a sign problem, and there is no really practical way uh, to deal with this right now, and the uh, Many different ways which were uh, put forward are somewhat indirect methods. And one of these methods is, for example, to consider the Taylor series expansion of your pressure okay, in, in baryon chemical potential and try to use this Taylor series expansion uh, to actually study non-zero uh, values of the baryon chemical potential. Okay? However, once you start doing this, uh, alternatively, you can also do imaginary uh, chemical potential and try to analytically uh, continue it to the real chemical potential. Well, um, and this, uh, this program was uh, uh, somewhat successful in the uh, uh, last uh, few years. All right. But once you start uh, doing the Taylor series expansion, you uh, need to also understand that uh, what limits the uh, knowledge you can extract from this Taylor series. Okay? Uh, and to discuss this, I will just consider just an arbitrary Taylor series. And of course, we know that this Taylor series converges uh, with the, within some disk defined by the radius of convergence, um, which you can find by analyzing the coefficients. Okay? But at the same time, the radius of convergence is defined by the distance from your expansion point uh, to the nearest singularity. Okay? To the nearest singularity. So in here, I will consider a very simple function. It is essentially a fermi dirac function in disguise. Okay, so this is function is very benign, as you can see, it's very smooth. Now we'll expand it to the, to the fourth order, to the tenth, to the fifth, to the hundreds, and you can see 
the, the expansion doesn't really improve uh, beyond a certain point. Well, we understand this now. Uh, it is because in the complex plane, there is a singularity. In this case, it's a pole. And this pole limits the series, uh, the expansion of the series around zero. So this is the real axis, and there is the pole. And it sits exactly at pi, at imaginary pi. Oh, with a few, so why do I discuss this, uh, why do you discuss this specific function? Because we actually will see some type of this uh, reincarnation of this function in QCD, because it's Fermi Dirac distribution, which we expect to be there as well. And uh, later in my talk, I will, I, will, I will return to this function. All right, so now the actual question is, if we want to study the phase transitions, uh, we need to understand if there are singularities which will be uh, uh, related to the phase transition and potentially to the critical points, okay? And for me, what was uh, very important is to understand if uh, some properties of these singularities, if they exist, of course, uh, if these properties are universal, okay? So, and to discuss this universality class and to introduce the singularities and introduce critical statics, the easiest way to proceed is to consider the simplest model, and in this case, I will consider Landau's, uh, Landau's uh, theory of phase transition, which tells uh, us that uh, the phase transition are manifestations of the broken symmetry. We can come up with the uh, uh, Landau free energy, which will dis uh, describe, for example, the behavior of easy model as a function of the two parameters. Uh, in this case, it's temperature or deviation uh, of temperature from its critical uh, value and the external magnetic field H. Okay, what is the difference between these two parameters? Magnetic field breaks the symmetry of Lagrangian in this, or this free energy. In this case, it's the two symmetry explicitly and temperature doesn't, okay? So by all means, lambda, this parameter of in, in front of five to the fourth, so you'll consider this constant. Okay, the phase diagram can be immediately established uh, by analyzing uh, uh, this free energy. You can just plot it for different values of T and H. For example, for H equals zero, you'll be able to see the second order phase transition. Um, if you would extract the position of this minimum, the expectation value of the order parameter, you will see it behaves like this. It's not non-zero at negative T. Uh, and then it approaches zero as a square root singularity. And this square root singularity is actually defines the critical exponent beta, which I mentioned in the beginning. And in this case, it is just one half. You can also study the first order phase transition if you look at temperatures below the critical temperature uh, as a function of H, you will see a discontinuity uh, in the dependence of the order parameter on the magnetic field. Okay, so now, I'm, uh, so now I would like to be a little bit more ambitious and I would like to study uh, this, uh, this phase diagram as a function of T and H at the same time, not by setting T to some value and H say to zero, but as a function of T and H, okay? Uh, so how to do this? I will take this, uh, I will take this effective uh, Landau theory and I will minimize it with respect to uh, uh, the value of the order parameter by just taking, you know, just the usual derivative with respect to phi. Okay, and this is what I do. I will get these simple equations of motion, okay? So in what uh, follows, I would like to just set lambda to one. I can always achieve this by rescaling of the field. Uh, since it is a constant parameter, I will not uh, be bothered with this lambda, okay? So now I would like to solve that. So how I will do this, I will come up with the following Kansas for the solution, okay? Uh, so this phi will be given by h to this uh, uh, power one third times the function of g, okay? So why do I do this? You will, uh, you will see in the moment. So if we substitute this Kansas into this equation and simplify everything, I will see that this function fg depends only, only on one single combination of these two parameters, okay? This is t divided by h to the power two thirds. So this, uh, this one third power here defines another critical exponent, it's delta. It's one over delta over here, okay? Very good, so this combination over here is what is called scaling, uh, scaling variable. And this function over here is one, uh, is, uh, is called the um, magnetic equation of state. And in this case, it's magnetic equation of state for the mean field, uh, uh, for the mean field to critical, um, critical physics. All right, so in this case, again, so beta is one half, delta is, is the three, but generically you'll have 
uh, that the scaling variable depends on the combination one divided by beta delta, and this combination will be present in my talk many, many times. Okay, now let's plot this function. It's kind of straightforward to do. So it will look like this. So there are two factors, there are two interesting things I want you uh, to mention about this function. First of all, at zero, it's just one, okay? And second, uh, at large negative argument, it uh, behaves as z minus z to the power beta without any, uh, without any proportionality constant in front, okay? So these two factors are fixed, uh, in this case, by setting lambda to one, but these two normalization factors are usually used for any critical uh, statics to define the magnetic equation of state, and these are called metric factors. All right, so the other um, critical exponent, lambda, can be extracted if you consider positive large values of z, okay, so this function falls as z to the, uh, to the power negative gamma. The pre-factor here will be non-trivial, and it will define another universal number, r chi, and I will come back to r chi in a second. All right, so this function actually looks very much uh, the same as the example I considered before, so it is very smooth. Well, and you can anticipate that there will be a singularity in the complex plane, and indeed, if you plot this uh, in the complex plane as a function of the real and imaginary values of z, you will see that there is young Lee singularity. In this case, it's a square root singularity. So let me just look at uh, on this picture from above. So there is this, uh, there are these two singularities, and they are called young Lee singularities. By the symmetry, what's known about them, uh, about the location, they are located at exactly this argument of this, of this number, it's pi divided by two beta delta, okay? And this beta delta in mean field, it's just two, uh, three halves, and in, uh, one can use as the actual easy universality class to compute uh, those, so for example, conformal bootstrap will give you this number. Okay, so additionally, uh, so this is a square root singularity in mean field, if you go beyond mean field, you will get that the singularity is modified somewhat, well, significantly, and that the singularity now is, again, is a branch point, as before, but the exponent is quite different. All right? So what are the defining equations? How did I, could I find the singularity? I can just minimize my free energy and then take the second derivative to find the singularity. And you would think that this is very much the same as finding the spin orders when I consider this uh, phase transition below the critical temperature, and indeed it is. So if I draw these spin orders, okay, so now this temperature is negative, and there are spin orders in this mean field equation of state, and they sit on the real axis, okay? And the defining set of equations are the same. So now let's plot uh, the entire phase diagram as a function of the real H, mag external magnetic field, and imaginary external magnetic field, and so this is Youngly H singularities. They tra traverse somewhere in the complex plane. And uh, this is the spin model. And by all means, uh, these lines are described by the same defining equation of state. In a sense, these lines are, have the same nature, okay? So this is a mean field. If you go beyond mean field, something will happen uh, to these uh, singularities. But first of all, the spin models cannot be present on the real axis, okay? Because of the convexity uh, of thermodynamic quantities. So they go into the complex plane, so and this is actual calculation. They go into the complex plane, and they sit in the complex plane, they disappear from the real axis over here, and this is young Lee H singularities. So what happens is that young Lee H singularities traverse and, and define this trajectory in the complex H plane. And they merge at one single point. And where they merge defines the position of the critical point. All right? So in that sense, you can say a weak argument that young Lee H singularity is continuously connected to standard critical point, or one can say even stronger statement that location and existence of the critical point is defined by young Lee H trajectories, okay? All right, so, and if this is not yet convincing that study of this is important, we can consider yet another argument. We can consider and try to understand young Lee H singularity as a critical point. So let's consider just the standard critical point. We know for the standard critical point I just discussed, there are two relevant directions which we have to tune to get to this critical point. It's temperature and magnetic field, right? 
So if you consider a tri-critical uh, point, you have to fix at least three uh, relevant variables. To, to, to tune three relevant variables, it's actually mathematically it's four, uh, but uh, in field theoretical applications, it's because of the uh, because of the constraints of the symmetry constraints. It's three. Okay. So now, what would be the simplest critical point? Well, which the one which will have only one uh, relevant direction? Let's call it protocritical point. Okay. And Liang Li H singularity is that protocritical point which has only one relevant critical variable. Okay, so now the number of the critical variables, for example, for the standard critical point, it's two, and therefore there are two independent critical exponents. So for young Li H singularity, it's only one relevant variable, and therefore there is only one uh, relevant critical exponent. We call it sigma. It's nothing else but one over delta, and the delta I discussed before, but now it is for the different universality class for young Li H universality class. All right. So even on this aesthetic uh, part, one would want to study the simplest critical point, point possible, OK? So now, given this importance, why the universal location of the singularity was not determined? So I would like to uh, discuss this question. So in a sense, this problem was defined quite long ago. I mean, probably Yang Li and Li Yang uh, papers in 52 uh, already crystallized this problem, then Kortman and Griffiths. We discuss it again approximately 20 years after. And finally, Fisher really uh, put the program of how to study this critical point, but the location wasn't determined. So there is a huge grab of, gap of approximately, uh, I don't know, about 50 years before the solution started to come up. So we published the first paper in 2020, and we uh, established the location at, in three dimensions. And the Malochikov's group started to work on this at approximately the same time, and they established, and the group from uh, Australia, and they established the location in uh, two uh, spatial dimensions. Okay? But again, so all of this is very, very recent. So why was not it discovered before, since the study of the phase transition was so vibrant in the past? Okay, and so here's the answer. So what tools do we have to study these phase transitions? and the critical point. So one of these uh, famous tools is what is called epsilon expansion. An epsilon expansion uh, builds around of what I just discussed, that the theory is very simple, close to the upper critical dimension where one can use the mean field, okay? So for the phi to the fourth theory, the upper critical dimension is four, and then you can compute using the mean field, and you will get the critical response one half, as, we, as you've seen. Okay, with my simple calculations. So now you can deviate from this simple limit uh, going towards uh, d equal three, so by this minus epsilon, you'll get the first correction. Uh, this was published by uh, Wilson Cogan in 79. Uh, then you can stop at no time. You can compute to the five loop uh, contribution. And uh, I think currently they even compute to the seven loop uh, in epsilon expansion. And all these uh, numbers in front can be uh, perturbatively uh, compute, computed, okay? Um, all right. So, uh, and this method was very successful in establishing critical amplitude, crit uh, critical exponents as well. So why cannot we use this to uh, actually study the young Li singularity? So the problem or underlying problem in that is the following, that young Li singularity is described by phi cubic theory. Okay, why is this phi cubic theory doesn't lead to the first to the first transition? Because the coupling in front of this phi cubic theory is imaginary. Okay, this is a very peculiar field theory. Okay, phi cubic theory has the upper critical dimension of six, not four. Okay, so it becomes simple, or uh, I can study this theory at d equals six. All right, over here. So, however, if you perform the epsilon expansion of the underlying universality class, the Ising universality class, you start expanding at the uh, upper critical dimension of phi to the fourth theory at four. And how does this manifest in the actual expansion if you would force yourself to compute uh, the location of the singularity? It is in the following way. So you get the location of the singularity at the tree level. This is computable. 
Now you can actually compute the first non-trivial correction, let me call it one loop. Uh, so the first non-trivial co co correction here of order of epsilon, and this is done here for arbitrary number of components of unitary articulars. And then when you go to the higher orders, you see that first of all, it's not anymore epsilon square. You have epsilon square times log epsilon, which is already kind of weird, but it is multiplied by the contribution which is defined by, the, by all loops of this expansion. And this is where you have to stop because it becomes non-perturbative, all right? And you don't, want, don't, don't uh, know what to do. So not a very similar problem happens in QCD at finite temperature when you do perturbative expansion, but it happens at higher orders that we do not really care. But here it happens at epsilon square log epsilon order. Okay, so and the only thing we, one can extract is a tree level and one loop, and that's it. Okay. However, the property of the young Li H singularity, for example, the critical exponent, can be established by performing the, uh, uh, the expansion near uh, the upper critical dimension of six. Okay, and this was done, uh, unfortunately, I forgot to cite the uh, Redland paper, by companies and company, uh, they were able to extract uh, the uh, young Li H singularity critical exponent up to the fifth loop. Of course, if you want to actually study the physical world, epsilon has to be three. It's a pretty, uh, uh, pretty uh, brave uh, continuation uh, uh, to reach the physical world. But um, so, and uh, there is a, there are of course studies uh, to extract this critical exponent by doing conformal bootstrap. Okay, so you can study the critical exponent. You, you know what type of the singularity there is in the complex plane, but you do not know its location. Okay, and this is what I want to study. The other method or the other tool we use in, uh, in trying to define the critical statics is, of course, uh, formulation on the lattice. Uh, or just, for example, lattice models like Ising model. But however, to study uh, the uh, young Lee singularity, you, can, you have to go to imaginary age, and there will be a sign problem, and you all know uh, the associated difficulties. Uh, so let me not stop uh, on that, because I'm talking to professionals here on this. So in other words, uh, epsilon expansion, lattice simulation, and finally conformal bootstrap are not equipped to locate young Lee singularity. Okay? So once you, these three tools I will take away from you, you're essentially left with nothing. There is no direct method to actually probe uh, the singularity. However, there is one, and this is what is called functional uh, renormalization group, also known as exact renormalization group approach. It will take me probably three hours to explain you what it is, so I'm not gonna do this. I will just kinda, um, um, I will just kinda motivate it. So what you do here, uh, you will just start with a bare classical action at small distances, at short distances and large momenta. Next, I would like to just perform a shell-by-shell -shell integration towards the infrared, okay? And this shell-by-shell -shell procedure will be described by a specific equation, uh, which is called, called Vetterich equation given over here. So it, it looks like a very simple equation, but it is a functional integral equation uh, and it's pretty difficult to solve in general. So what does this, uh, what does uh, uh, slice these shells in this momentum? Uh, this is this uh, regulator function we call, and it just essentially li likes as a mass-like term to suppress infrared, okay? All right. So there is this machinery over here so what is, uh, uh, and it will define the flow from, in, uh, from UV towards the infrared, okay? And this, this is that equation, okay? So the, uh, the process of this approach is exact, it's non-perturbative, it doesn't have sign problem. Well, the cons are, it requires truncation, okay? And in general, to apply this to uh, a field theory, uh, I would be very cautious. Uh, because your truncation might define the physics you study, okay? To apply these two young mills, you have to come up with a good justification for your truncation, okay? So, however, uh, if you study long wave dynamics, you know what truncation will work. It's just derivative expansion, okay? And it was shown that derivative expansion uh, for the critical exponents, the program was... Uh, uh, was um, was put forward, and they were able to show that the critical exponents are convergent, uh, and that they are getting closer and closer to the numbers 
into the precision of conformal bootstrap. Okay, so I will use derivative expansion. Uh, in other words, so I will consider this uh, effective action. I will consider just the log, uh, just momentum independent term, uh, UK and its flow in this, in this space. And uh, the uh, first non trivial correction, which is defined by this uh, wave function randomization. The equation for this, what is called average potential, is very simple. So it's given by this equation. So, and oftentimes I will use this notation for, phi, for the field squared divided by two. Okay, but this equation is still complicated because you see on the right hand side, on the left hand side, you have uh, this average potential, but it also enters to the right hand side. There are integrals and everything. So, it, and there are derivatives with respect to the field variable. So, it is still a very complicated equation. Okay, and of course, uh, uh, so this normalization, uh, renormalization wave function enters as well. Wave function normalization enters as well. So now if you go and compute the functions for this wave function normalization, they look even worse. So it's given over here. I will not go into the details. So again, there are integrals you have to take for a specific regularization function. So it becomes a little bit more complicated. And again, so what you will end up with some partial differential equations which you have to solve. Quite complicated, uh, quite complicated adventure. So what? So in this, this forces uh, us to simplify it a little bit. So instead of considering just the functions u and z as a function of phi, I will expand them into the Taylor series. Okay, and I will consider the truncations at some order. So most of the results I'm going to show is order 12 and 6 correspondingly. Okay, so there are some there are some details I'm not going to go into. So at the end of the day, it will all boil down to 1626 coupled uh, stiff differential equations. I've never seen them. Why? Because to derive them takes a little bit. So I'm doing this on Mathematica, in Mathematica, and then I dump this equation in file, and this file is uh, like of order of you know 18 gigabyte. Okay. So these are some very complicated equations. Um, so. Moreover, those equations are stiff, and therefore I have to use implicit solvers. Okay? And now it becomes really, really slow to actually solve them. As, for example, initial conditions, it takes months on the high performance cluster. Okay? But, you know, we can still do it though. All right, so here's an example of this flow, uh, just to give you something uh, uh, to look at. Uh, so, this is uh, what I would call anomalous dimension. For those who doesn't know this, it's just essentially a measure, measure of importance of fluctuations. So I will start with some initial condition, and to simplify my life, I will start with the initial condition which will correspond to the fixed point of this Wilson Fisher singularity, uh, of the Wilson Fisher fixed point, uh, or, or just the usual easy and critical uh, point. Okay? So, and you see that. The anomalous dimension there is constant. I will deviate a little bit from this, uh, from this critical surface, okay, so that uh, I will be able to, to go to young age singularity. So, uh, but let's consider just here one line, d equals four. Okay, d equals four for the line universality class, let's say using model, uh, it's just the, 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 run, the fluctuations are not important, so the anomalous dimension is just zero. Okay, anomalous dimension is just zero. But then once you start approaching, Young age singularity, the anomalous dimension becomes non zero, and it's actually pretty large. It's uh, about negative 0.3. Okay, this already shows you the fact I told you before that the upper critical dimension for phi to the fourth theory is four, okay, and this is why it's zero, but for, the under, for young age singularity, it's six, and this is why you see the importance of the fluctuations uh, in number of dimensions four. Of course, one can repeat the same calculation for d equals three, so it gives you the following flow. In this, in this space, all right? <clears throat> so using this approach, uh, I, we were able to, to, uh, to find the location of the singularity. And in contrast to the previous talk, we actually can use uh, arbitrary and tau, and in the sense we can use arbitrary number of dimensions, not only arbitrary number of uh, the uh, field components. So, and here I, we computed these points over here uh, along, the, uh, along these lines, these orange points using this functional normalization group approach. So let's see this inset first. So this is the, uh, the mean field result. So now this dashed line is that epsilon expansion which just gives me the, the linear correction, okay? And uh, the orange lines, uh, orange dots uh, approach that 
Well, and this is done by this function normalization group calculations. All right, um, so, and we went all the way to, down to 2.7 in number of spatial dimensions. Below the 2.7, the calculations are so long that we never had the patience to actually wait and extract them. So now there is another point which is uh, uh, known. It's d equals 2. This is thanks to uh, uh, the Malochikov's group. Uh, and they extracted this number up to uh, fifth uh, digit. And uh, recently there was a paper about two weeks ago that uh, by, the other, by the other Australian group and they extract this number to insane precision in d equals 2. In number of dimensions d equals 1 for this universality class, for easing universality class, uh, this can be analytically computed. We you know this in four dimensions, that, that, and we filled in the gap over here, so we computed it for uh, d equals 3. All right. <clears throat> So now uh, we also can study the location of the singularity for all relevant universality classes for QCD. Well, so this was easing before. Now we will have uh, O2 universality class, O3, O4, O5, and uh, we, we don't have to limit ourselves and go all the way to the infinity. So here we uh, plot only up to 20, but we also did the calculations which show that the large n limit is approached asymptotically at asymptotically large n. And at large n limit, we actually know the location of the singularity exactly. Okay. Um, next, uh, one can put all of these figures in just one plot and uh, try to uh, uh, see how uh, all the singularities for different universality class depends on the number of dimensions, and you'll get these numbers as well. So here, uh, I was showing you the location of the singularity as a function of Zc divided by this R chi which I mentioned at the very beginning, this is just some universal number. Technically, this is easy for us to extract. But of course, we can just map it to the usual ZC. Now the precision is not as good as before, uh, and we'll get these numbers. All right, so why uh, are, is this location is important? Let's uh, come back to this function I discussed in the very beginning, so this magnetic equation of state, and expand it near in the Taylor series expansion, well, as we kind of do it on the lattice when we study, when we perform the Taylor series of expansion in mu b, let's expand it into the power series. The location of the singularity and its properties will tell you a lot about how the asymptotic, uh, how the asymptotic uh, expansion coefficients behave, and this is the form. And as you can see by orange here, I showed the numbers which are defined by the young gauge university class, okay, and the, uh, the associated location. And maybe Gerald uh, will mention more about this. All right, so now I would like to consider an actual QCD in the remaining five minutes. Uh, so, okay, so to the QCD, if there is a critical point somewhere in the, uh, in the mu plane, so here I would like to show both real chemical potential and imaginary chemical potential. So the imaginary chemical potential at, ne at the negative axis and the real chemical potential at positive axis. Okay, so at the real critical point, this young gauge singularities merge as we discussed before, uh, and the picture will look like this. So the singularities which I uh, worked out with you uh, by considering uh, the, uh, this function which was a uh, Fermi uh, Dirac distribution in disguise, will give, will give this Robert Y singularities. Okay, uh, most probably Simran, your Euroflex uh, fellow, will mention more about this. So now, if you go to the temperatures above this, okay, so what we would call this crossover kind of region, uh, so you will see that these singularities are somewhere in the complex plane. Okay, this couple relate to the Carl Young VH, and the other singularities are Robert Schwartz. Now, if you approach the Robert Schwartz phase transition, so the critical point, so these Carl singularities will merge with Robert Schwartz phase transition once, and they both will approach the imaginary axis, so you'll have the situation like that. Okay, so it just goes to show that everything is defined by the trajectory of young age singularities in the complex plane. Very good, so now let's use that. So let's consider this kind of, so the temperatures are of order of 170 MeV, so where we see the crossover. So in this case, you'll have a configuration of singularity something like this, now what I would like to do, I would like to consider the Fourier coefficients, uh, which can be computed on the lattice. So the Fourier coefficients are computed for imaginary chemical potential. So what you do, you take the baryon density, 
and you integrate along the imaginary chemical potential axis. A pretty straightforward uh, task which can be done. All right, and you can really improve your precision pretty well. So now, of course, I mean, what's, uh, what's uh, so important about this line that, of course, we can always, uh, we can always uh, modify this path of integration. So we can then modify this path of the integration in the following way that it will go uh, around all these cuts over here, okay? So now, uh, it is important to realize that NB is actually a periodic function in uh, imaginary chemical potential, and therefore the contribution from, this, uh, from these things over here, they will completely cancel. Okay, so the contribution from infinity will also cancel because uh, you are doing manipulation with something which has an exponential in it. And what you will left with is only the contribution or discontinuities on these cards. All right, so somehow what uh, you were trying to do here, so for me, uh, you are essentially just integrating along uh, my young V singularity cards. All right, so, and from here I can actually, uh, by knowing the properties of the singularities, I can tell you how the Fourier coefficients will behave for a symptotically large case, or you know, orders of the of the of the coefficient. So it is given over here. Okay, so this is singular. This is due to the singularity over here, the Kyle singularity, and this is due to Robert Y singularity. So now let me just try and use this uh, method to feed uh, some data. So. We are trying to do this for the latest data as well, but for now, uh, let me just consider some, some, some toy model. So in this case, I just take quark meson model, but I include fluctuations to make it a little bit more challenging. So I will get the following data. So this point is the data obtained from this model. In this model, I know where young VH singularity is, so it's located at these values of the chemical potential divided by temperature. Okay, but now with this fit just adjusted by the first entry over here, I, will, I, I can also fit and try to extract this location. And those, so this is the result, and as you can see, I mean, it's not perfect, but it's pretty good. Okay, this just goes to show that in principle, and by the way, so I start my asymptotic uh, fit at pretty low uh, values of k. I mean, this just goes to show that the analytical structure of what happens in the complex plane is important for most of the thermodynamic properties, either through the Taylor series expansion, or for example, through this kind of modification of the path. But we all know that, you know, a function is defined by its singularities, right? All right, uh, so this is my conclusion. So the conventional methods uh, which we use to study the critical statics fail to describe the location of young VH singularity. So the functional remodelization group is uniquely posed to, to, to actually locate it. It doesn't have a sign problem, it's systematically improvable, additional, uh, plus of this, one can actually compute at any d, uh, including non-integer values of d, and at any number of n, including negative n, and even uh, uh, non-integer n. Um, so we use the first order derivative expansion uh, function normalization group to extract this location for Ising universality class and uh, most of the relevant universality classes we can imagine in QCD. Okay, so, and I try to demonstrate to you that the, importance of this young VH singularity and its location for, for quant or from quantum chromodynamics and its phase diagram. So first of all, I showed you that the high order coefficients of the Taylor series expansion would be defined by the location of the singularity and its properties. The Fourier coefficients are defined by this as well. And the direct application to largest QCD, which Simran is going to talk to you about today, uh, can be also applied here. Okay, so the future uh, of these studies is just going to precision. So right now we only can extract for easing universality class up to the third digit. So our goal is to reach the six digit precision. Uh, so to reach the same precision as for critical exponents. Thank you very much. <laughs>